Tim. It's an honor to be here today uh, with uh, the royalty of the uh, science fiction and fantasy crowd, so it, it's a lot of fun today. Um, Want everybody to meet Lynn? Lynn and I go back, what, five minutes? Maybe six. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're expecting today, but I can assure you this isn't it. Uh, uh, but I hope to give you some value for the hour that you spend with me, or 50 minutes or so. Um, got my name on the program. Here's my email. If you have any, if I don't address something that you wanted to cover today, and you want to ask some follow-up questions that go beyond the scope of our time together, I'd be more than happy to hear from you directly. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm on there, and uh, I'll accept your connection request, and you can send me uh, uh, direct messages uh, through LinkedIn if you prefer. But either way, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I really don't see myself uh, as an expert who's any smarter than you in any of these areas. I just happen to have visited this country before you, so you don't have any less aptitude to be a successful traveler than Rick Steves does, right? He just knows more of the back streets because he's been there first. So that's what I'm doing for you today, to let you know that there's room for anybody who wants to use your voice as part of your artistry. And my job today is to just show you, here's the door. Come on in. So that's my goal for today. Um, Nick asked me to share a little bit uh, about my background. I don't really want to take up a lot of your time with that biographical information, but I'll tell you, uh, for the last 10 years or so, I sold out to the man, and I've been doing uh, most of my creative writing and voice work in a corporate environment, but I also worked in commercial broadcasting for many years. Uh, the last radio station I worked at was the uh, NPR uh, Classical Music Affiliate in Phoenix, and I worked in some large stations in Los Angeles, and so, I've had an opportunity to have a lot of fun doing things with my voice. Now you'll notice from the conversation that there's nothing special about my voice at all. I've just had a little bit of practice. I'm not a movie trailer guy. I never audition for those in-world jobs because that's not who I am. Everybody's a type, and this is what you'll discover too, that there is an outlet for your voice and you can find that type where you fit. Most of the commercials I did that were successful, they just needed somebody who sounded approachable and like the guy next door. And that's what I do. And I um, actually use those opportunities to go from being a broke-ass wannabe to a thousand air. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can help you do that too. I want to know who I'm talking to today because this session really is more about you than it is about me, and I, I want to be a direction finder for you. So uh, we can just do the old-fashioned show of hands thing. Um, how many of you right now are published authors, just by a show of hands, okay? And how many more are not published yet but want to be? Okay, good. Get from want to be to got to be. And you can do that. That's what this whole weekend is all about. And um, there's a lot of great presenters here. And uh, I look forward to learning from some of my colleagues. And uh, again, I feel very lucky to have this time in front of you today. How many of you have actually done voiceover work uh, in the past? Either paid or volunteer, doesn't matter. Yeah, a few extra hands went up when I said volunteer. So it's still work, right? You should accept a job for one of three reasons only. It should be for revenue. It should be for your resume or for relationships. If you get all three, great. But one or two out of three, take it. You know, because it's going to build your body of work, it's going to get you more comfortable with the medium, and it's going to help you be more confident every time you approach a microphone or any kind of creative opportunity. Um, how many have done audio production using software and, and studio tools before, by yourself? OK. And, a little bit? Okay. I'm just starting to learn. <laughs> okay, well good. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for today, but I'm not scripted. And I really want to, I, I brought like a kit of parts to share with you today. And so I, I want to kind of adapt my content 
on the fly to really fit you know, your real world situation. And hopefully you'll walk out of here with an idea, with some action item that you can jump on and that's going to move your career forward. And uh, so that's my goal today. Uh, I'm going to allot uh, as much time as I can for questions at the end, and uh, let's just dive in. <coughs> Most of the people in this room, I'm sure, know a lot more about writing than I do. Can you tell me, just any guess is fine, there's no wrong answer, what do these people have in common? They're writers. Writers, good, yeah. Do they all narrate their own books? They do. Yes, anything. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. Narrate their own books. They've, the every one of these authors has <laughs> successfully voiced their own books. And none of them are particularly known. Well, David Sedaris maybe because he's become kind of a, an NPR phenomenon. But most of these people were not media personalities in any way. But why do you suppose it would be better for the author as opposed, as opposed to a professional voiceover artist um, write, narrate their own book? Pronounce it right. Mm -hmm. Pronunciation is great, right? Because you have that native affinity with the material. What else? They're closer to the material. It's their material. Yeah. There's heart in their speaking material. There's an emotional connection, right? So I think authenticity. Just you don't know, have. Just shout out. What else? Connection with their readers. Audience connection, readers. Yeah. What else? They know their characters. Character familiarity. Great. Interpretation. Everybody brings their own interpretation. He created the material. He knows what that character is supposed to be like. Yeah, exactly. To save money. Ego. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Ego. They want to be out there. I don't know if this was mentioned or not, but because they have the love and the energy for the subject that nobody else is going to have. Yeah, that was touched on in different ways. And they're more invested. They're more invested in success. Personal investment. Yeah. I mean, you know this, having done a book from beginning to middle to end. I mean, that it's got to be an idea that you love enough to stick with it for two years, it's, right? It's cheaper. It costs a lot of money to hire someone to read it. It does. If you can do it yourself. If you don't have the money to hire someone, that doesn't need to stop you. There's a huge DIY motivation here that we'll talk about in a little while. So it's for an audience, audience benefit. Often the audience mm -hmm. likes to hear the author and his or her own book. Yeah, it, it, that, that's a really interesting distinction because I'm going to touch on that a little bit in a minute too. But I think that just the idea of giving your audience access to you, I think is something that, that readers really want. Okay, let's skip ahead a little bit. The reason I asked you to point out all those factors is because those are all good reasons why you should feel personally welcome into this process. And if you get nothing else, out of today, I hope what you'll take from this session is, is permission to get started, because you have it. So, the audiobook market, another great reason to do it, it's lucrative. Um, a lot of industry analysts are saying that the market worldwide could be as big as three and a half billion dollars people are going to spend. I'm driving a big chunk of that, because I have an Audible subscription. <laughs> I, I'm an information junkie in my car, and it's really the only product I have in my life at all. And, and so this, this keeps me sane on, on the way between Holiday and Draper every day. Um, the, the, U, the domestic U.S. market, they're estimating around $1.8 And the Wall Street Journal has come out with a forecast saying that audio books in particular are the fastest growing segment of publishing today. So all these are great reasons for you to be in on it. <clears throat> Seth Godin claims this. I think I thought of it first. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let him have it. Only the talented worry about mediocrity. We're all, we're all artists in here, right? In one form or another. And I think we all suffer from that, that nagging question in the back of our minds. What if my work sucks and I'm the only one who doesn't know? Well, this keeps a lot of deserving and gifted people out of audiobooks and doing voice work. Because I mentioned earlier, I'm not the movie trailer guy. And, you know, 
I can take hormone pills and you know smoke a dozen cigars a day, and no matter what I do, I'm never going to sound like that guy. But I can own the niche that I'm in, and there's plenty of room. And that's what I'm trying to say to you today: is that there's plenty of room for everybody. So um, you care about mediocrity probably because you're better than you think you are in a lot of areas. And really, the only difference between you and the people that are getting paid for it right now is uh, maybe a little deviousness and the willingness to show up. Everything else you can pick up on the way. Hi, what's your, tell me your name. I'm Orlo Goodson. Orlo, pleasure. And I have a bachelor's degree in motion picture television and radio production. Oh, great. The, the, what I wanted to say is having a weird voice is a little bit strange. Can actually be a plus. I agree. It, it helps create character. <coughs> yeah. So if you don't think your voice is as pretty as somebody else's, that may be to your advantage. Listen to the stringers and the reporters on All Things Considered or Morning Edition. Or spend the afternoon on a Saturday and take in a few episodes or uh, replays of This American Life. Or listen to Bob Dylan. Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, Bob Dylan. I'd love to hear a conversation between Tom Petty and Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a debate that I would see before. Okay. So let's talk about the voice for a minute because you've all anticipated my thoughts here brilliantly. And there are types. And quirkiness sells. If you can't fix it, feature it. Right? Stan Freeberg, back in the 60s, he's a humorist uh, that I absolutely adored. Uh, he did a satire album called The United States of America, and it's basically his bizarre interpretation of characters in U.S. history. Um, and he also had an advertising agency, and his motto for the agency was slightly more honesty than the client had in mind. <laughs> so he would get these underdog, you know, little struggling startup companies, and Whatever was odd about them, whether it was their name or their size or the, you know, the, the um, lack of competitiveness for their product, he would feature that front and center in the commercials. And he and his clients were hugely successful. You can go back and look at his uh, Contadina tomato paste sauce, um, the Gino's pizza roll guy. He turned him into a multi-millionaire with those commercials for Gino's pizza rolls in the 60s. Uh, S.K. Franks, uh, Chen King, Chen, nobody ever thought of buying Chinese food in a can at the grocery store until Stan Freeberg came along. And he just took that idea, oh thank you, how do you know I needed that? Because <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so um, he came up with a concept for, to, get the public interested in something that they had never considered before. And he said, uh, he put this magazine ad out that said, nine out of 10 doctors recommend Chungking Chinese food. And <laughs> you, you look at the next panel and there's, there's only one white guy. They're all standing there in the, white, in the white medical coats. And everybody else was Asian in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if we can get away with that today. <laughs> so again, this, just to illustrate that quirkiness sells, and if you, if you research Stan Freeberg a little bit, it's pretty entertaining. So let's talk about what to do with the voice that you have. I was a music major in college, and I used to teach voice lessons. I'm just going to do the, the bio in breadcrumbs, because we got a perfect <clears throat> okay. Uh, and I used to teach uh, music lessons of various types. And it was amazed the number of people that told me, well, I'm not creative or I can't sing. And I'm here to tell you that if you can carry on a conversation with another person in a normal tone of voice, you have all the tools that you need to be able to sing. I had a golf teacher tell me once, Tim, there's nothing wrong with your game that you can't fix with lessons and practice. So <laughs> I, I'm going to tell you the same thing about your art, your, your uh, artistry with your voice. Um, the first thing to pay attention to if you want to improve your sound and your stamina and your clarity is to pay extra, extra attention to your breathing. Try a yoga class because um, I have to tell you that the hot yoga classes that I took actually revolutionized my breathing. 
and improve my on-air sound. I was taking those classes while I worked at KDAQ in Phoenix, and I couldn't believe the difference that it made in my on-air presence. We had a stand-up studio, which helped. Um, but to really be careful about using that, I don't want to show you too much here, but to use that, that proper diaphragmatic breathing, just be aware of your breath. And make sure that you're not taking these short, choppy breaths up into your chest. Whenever you prepare to deliver a light, always breathe as deeply as you can through the diaphragm. And I won't spend time on the minutia of that because there's 102 videos you can watch on it as soon as you leave the room. But I can't overstress the importance that breathing, proper breathing, is going to fix 60 to 70 percent of any challenges you think might have with your voice. Another thing for people that are new to this process, some people just despise the sound of their own voice because of the, the cavities and the bone structure in our heads. We sound a lot different to ourselves inside than we do to most people in the outside world. Well, I've gotten used to that just because I've been doing it so long, but the first time I got one of those little press the two button cassette recorders and tried to do a commercial, when I was 14, I was appalled at how I sounded. But I was the only one who was appalled. To everybody else, I just sounded like me. And the more you do it, the more you'll, you'll get accustomed to it. So um, relaxation is very important. People tend to speak, you know, they get really tense. I've seen a lot of singers do this where they just sing with the jaw set. So anything that you can do to just develop a much looser physicality, keep your jaw loose, deep diaphragmatic breathing, and then the next thing is just to practice as much as you possibly can. Read everything out loud. The people who live with you are going to eventually want to drive you out of the house because you'll be reading cereal boxes and newspaper <coughs> clippings and things that you find in the magazine. Um, try doubling the announcer, uh, the booth announcer on the TV station. See if you can follow along and repeat what they're saying. What, what inflections would you change? We talked about listening to audiobooks, and, um, or I think it was your point about um, the professionals, and you know that it's it's much more affordable to do it on a do-it-yourself basis. I've listened to audiobooks by professional actors that have won you know stage and screen awards, and there's dozens of times where I sit there and think, oh, I don't think that's the inflection the author intended. I would have totally phrased that differently, or I would have moved the pause somewhere else. And I apologize in advance because I'm going to ruin any listening that you ever do from today forward. <laughs> so, now, and or you probably know this from going to film school, right? Did it change the way that you watch movies? Oh, well, I hated me to watch a movie because I analyzed them on camera part. I subdivided them. She says you ruin every film you see. <laughs> so yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> If you're building yourself a little recording studio for doing your books, it doesn't need to be any bigger than a phone booth. It can nope. be a closet. The, a lot of the, the voiceover booths you find in studios are just little boxes yeah. that go in and close the door. And I mean, you can set something like that in your house very, very inexpensively. That's true. For doing audio books. Now, if you want to do a bigger production and do it like multiple actors and do a, a almost like an old time radio theater, you're gonna need more space. But if you're doing a one voice or even a two voice reading, you can do it in a really small space. Yeah, even interview podcasts will work in a setting like that. Yeah, but, and this is the thing, a lot of the barriers to entry that we think are gonna keep us out of this business <coughs> are often imaginary. And um, you can get away with a lot of hacks and a lot of shortcuts. Did I miss a hand? Okay, all right, good. Um, so I want to include everybody. So, all right. Um, so we were talking about the voice. So I'm stressing the importance of practice, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit more now. Has anybody read uh, On Writing by Stephen King? You probably all yeah. I figured you probably all found it before I did. I love that book, and I reread it every couple of years because I just get fresh insights from it. This is a quote that just really floored me. He said, if you don't have time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. As simple as that. And I really believe that's true. And I think that same 
way of thinking applies to voice work as well. If this is something you really want to do, the only thing stopping any of us from getting into that is us. And it, it requires a willingness to um, do several things. Read as much as you can. Read outside of your field so that you get familiar with terminology and ideas that might be presented to you in a recording session. Um, listen obsessively. And now I want you to begin listening critically as well. What are they doing with their breathing? How's their pace? Are they using the right inflections at the right point in the mind? Are they easy to follow? Do they have any distracting uh, ticks or mouth noises, anything like that? And the more you become aware of these things in the surround, the more mindful you'll begin to be of these different kinds of things in your delivery as well. And a problem clearly stated is 90% solved. So the, the first step to improvement is, is really awareness and finding those gaps. And of course, continue to write all the time. Now, there's something very special about writing when it comes to writing for the ear versus writing for the eye. And you can see a script like for a, a radio commercial, or maybe it's a promotional announcement in a podcast or some kind of internet radio show that you're doing, or maybe it's just the the front plate material, the billboard material that you're doing at the beginning of your audio book, a lot of times that material has been written to flow easily for the eye. And it's grammatically correct. Any editors in the room? Uh-oh. Two, okay. Three. I'll call three. Man, there's more. Okay, you're coming out of the woodwork now. You're scaring me. Um, there's a time when you're writing for the ear sometimes to ignore the rules because you have to always remember that the audience is coming at this material fresh and they've only got an instant to grasp what you're saying. So there are occasions where you're going to need to bend uh, some grammatical rules in order to make the material more accessible for the ear because they're not going to be able to go backwards and, and reread that line to make sure they understand it. And a lot of times, if you're finding yourself getting stuck on a particular phrase, you know, a particular point in the script, chances are it was written for the eye and not for the ear. And so I'm giving you license today. I wish I had little buttons to pass out. I'll, I'll do that next year if I get invited back. Um, pass out buttons where you have license to mark up the script. Okay? So the first thing you do, never try to record reading cold. In the radio business, they called that rip and read, and our news director frowned on it because we, we had those old um, telex, you know, the news wire system where we get the Associated Press copy coming across, and they called it rip and read because as you were racing into the studio to do your newscast, you'd grab that roll off, off the teletype, and then you just run into the studio and read it, and some pretty embarrassing moments would happen. I did a back announce one time for a classical set. It was some trumpet soloist from Scandinavia with a big orchestra we've never heard of. And uh, I was not prepared. I was down the hall stacking music for the next shift and I ran back in just seconds before my break and I went to back announce the thing and pulled up the, the liner notes and I said, and that was a trumpet solo. The guy's name was Hakan Hardenberger. And I said, trumpet solo by Arlon Hackenberg. <laughs> that, that went out to 100,000 people during prime time in Phoenix. And luckily, my boss was not listening. I was just standing there waiting for the general to dial into the control room. Nothing happened. Maybe it upped his sales, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mark up your script, and it's okay to underline important words. I'll talk about that on the last bullet. Um, pay attention to where the natural breaks are going to occur in your phrasing, and give yourself time to breathe, uh, like I'm not doing now. I tend to get a little breathless in my delivery, and so sometimes just whatever mark you want to use, a slash, an apostrophe, something to remind yourself to start those really important phrases that you want to land uh, really well with the audience. Make sure that you've got a full tank for all those and just give yourself time to breathe. Chunk it down. 
draw circles or boxes around different parts of the script where you want to shift your emphasis or where you're trying to lead the listener in a new direction. Again, we talked about this a couple minutes ago, but be careful to edit for the ear. And uh, there's a term that I learned in a, a workshop. Uh, he was a famous choir director many years ago. Uh, Roger Wagner was his name. And he did a lot of classical albums out of LA. And I got to go to a choral workshop with him, and he talked to us about the, the idea of gravitation. And the, the essence of what he was saying was that in every melody, in every musical phrase, there's naturally going to be one note that's more important than all the rest. And everything else that you do in that musical phrase should create a sense of gravitation for the listener that's going to draw them to that important point that you want to land on. And it works just as well for the spoken word as it does for singing. So if you want to try to vary the tone of your voice, you can use as much of your range as you can. Now that can be overdone, and you hear like these different kinds of up talk and very repetitive sing-songy delivery where you can tell that somebody is trying to manage the tone of their voice rather than just use it. And uh, so again, this is something that only comes through practice and you want to record yourself. Eventually you'll become very comfortable with the sound of your own voice and you'll hear less and less of a difference between what's in your head and the spoken word that you get back from the recording. And so, um, you can trust me when I tell you that it, it will get better. Now, of all the things that you can do to improve your voice, I'm going to tell you the one technique that's worked, worked best for me. Cheat! <laughs> People said, uh, you know, friends say, oh, you worked in radio, let me hear your radio voice. And my answer is, well, I hope I don't have one, because the hardest thing about the radio business for me was just learning to be myself when I cracked the mic. I did an audition uh, just before I got hired on at KBAQ, and the, the uh, general manager said, all right, here, take this tape and just grab a couple of records, any ones you want, and just do a couple of mock breaks for me. I want to hear what you sound like. Well, I was changing out the CDs, and I was just continuing to talk like I'm talking to you guys. Well, I'm going to move the CD and I'm going to do this over here. He was listening back to all that and he said, that's the guy I want on the radio. Not the part that you thought he was going to do. So that's the advice that I would give to you is just learn to be yourself. My first day on the air uh, was in Alaska in 1984. Um, I offered to sweep the floors at this radio station because I'd been a music major. And he said, oh. Well, if you can do, do that, then we want you to run our automation for the overnight shift. So I said, great. So the very first thing I had to do, all I had to do was play Casey Kasem's American Top 40. <laughs> it came on vinyl albums about this big. And what would happen when you get to the end of the band, like where, well, they have vinyl now. So, uh, you know, where the band separates, that's where you, you'd stop the record, you play the commercial, and while the commercial's going, then you you know, rock the record back and forth and get it ready to start the next segment. I didn't have to talk. All I had to do was push one button and play a Dairy Queen commercial. And my finger was shaking so bad, I could barely, I could barely aim for the button. I almost had to hold my arm to hit start. And, but it, it got a lot easier after that and you realize, okay, these little mistakes, you know, like hard on Hackenberger, they're gonna happen. Nobody died. Nobody died. You know, we don't have to attach so much importance to these things. So, um, again, you know, the idea of having a radio voice, just try to be yourself. The way you can enhance what you have naturally is to get a better mic. And we'll talk about some you know, different microphones that you could use. What's recommended really for this kind of work that we do is a dynamic uh, directional mic. And there's some that you can, you know, a decent one is going to cost you anywhere from two to $400. You can spend as much as you want. You can also get one for between 50 and 70 bucks that'll do just fine if you're starting out. You do not have to spend a fortune on gear to get going. And it's better if you don't, because then you're not stressed about the money and you can really focus on the work, which is why, after all, we're all here. Right, Lynn? Yep. <coughs> I told you, see? Pay attention to Lynn. <laughs> 
Dynamic microphones in particular, the ones I'm thinking of are like the ElectroVoice uh, RE20. Uh, my favorite is the Shure SM7. There's a Sennheiser MV420 something, 421 I think it is. Don't hold me to that. I've had good results with all of those microphones and they're all kind of in the you know, $200 to $500 range roughly. Um, they have what's called proximity effect. So the closer you work the mic, the more it's going to accentuate the, the lower and mid-range sound of your voice. So you'll, you'll naturally have a deeper and more resonant quality to your voice just by taking advantage of proximity effect. And that's how I tend to sound better on a soundtrack than I do in real life. Other tricks you can use is equalization and compression. There, I won't get into the details today, but again, there's tons of Adobe uh, tutorials that you can get for free and dozens of YouTube videos, lynda.com. Uh, a lot of the major equipment resellers like uh, B&H Photo, uh, Sam Ash, uh, Broadcast Supply up in Washington, um, Musician's Friend, a lot of those have really good demo videos that you can just watch for free because they want you to buy the gear. So they have experts on there demonstrating all of them and showing you what all the knobs and buttons and lights do and you, can, you don't have to spend a dime to, to get that information. So equalization, there are certain frequencies that tend to accentuate the human voice um, and some of the mixers or little uh, digital recorders that you can buy have some preset filters in them. Digital audio software sometimes has like built-in compression features that can do, just do a little bit of light compression on your voice and, and it, it helps squish everything into that more uh, favorable range. Um, another way that I cheat in the studio that I use every day at work is a tube preamp. The signals coming out of those dynamic microphones tend to be pretty weak. You can use them as they are, but they'll tend to pick up, it'll tend to bring in Excuse me, more noise with the signal. So a preamplifier, um, this is kind of a fancy one that's, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred dollars. And then I bought some special tubes to replace the stock ones that went in it. This will boost the signal before it gets to your mixer, and it'll help your, what it does is improve the power and clarity of that voice signal coming into the mixer. It makes the sound of your voice stronger than the no noise floor. So there's going to naturally be less um, distortion or um, hiss or any kind of digital noise in, in your recording. So that'll, that'll help you a lot. So, quick question. Yeah. Why, why tube as opposed to solid state? Uh, tube uh, just tends to have a warmer analog sound. <coughs> but there are solid state devices that are affordable and they do work fine. There are some that are actually the circuitry is programs and they make what the effects of the tube will do. Um, but it just gives it that kind of warmer, more tiny kind of tone. And it's really a preference. There is no right or wrong. I like the tube sound because it works better for me. But there, there are a lot of little digital, just inline preamp boxes that you can buy that are very affordable. You can find them again on Sam Ash, b and Photo, uh, what did I say, Musician's Friend, Broadcast Supply. Even Amazon actually has a lot of good deals. You can just grab, you can, you can spec it out on the other site and then buy it on Amazon, sometimes cheaper. So that's how they're disrupting the business. Um, and that sounds kind of satanic in a way, but I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit why, why actually what Amazon has done has made the world a more welcoming place for all of us. Um, I would get into that right now. So yeah, it's, it's a preference, honestly. Um, two works better for me. Uh, but you can get a little digital or solid state inline device for a fraction of the cost of the one on the screen here and honestly it will work just fine. All you want to do is take that weaker microphone signal and just bump it up so that it's that much higher above the noise floor and the, the quality of your finished recording is going to be measurably better. Okay, I've got just a few minutes left. I've gone deeper into some of these things than I meant to. Um, I get kind of carried away with the subject matter. The point of all of this, really, everything that we we're talking about today is to have a heart for the listener. You know, to, to really care about your audience passionately. And the reason we think about all these things, the sound of the voice, the delivery, the equipment that we use, the quality,
quality of the recording is to prevent anything from happening that's going to take your listener out of the story. We're, we're, you're creating a world for them, as you've already done in your, your books and your short stories and the different types of presentation materials that you've done. You're creating a world, and you're asking them to suspend their disbelief for a period of time. And so anything that we can do to keep distractions and interruptions out of, out of their way it's going to shake them out of that world, so much the better. So all of this is about having a passion for the reader. That's why we do what we do. So things that have to do with listener experience, uh, we already touched on the quality of the recording, so just any kind of ambient noise that's in there. And we'll be talking about a lot of specifics in this in the part two. If any of you come back today, we'll drill down to, into those things in a lot more detail. Um, the clarity of the recording, and that has to do with your delivery and also just the keeping a consistent tone and volume level throughout. And then thinking about the format as well. There's absolutely no reason why your material can't be up for sale in Audible this week if you have something that you want to put together. Um, you go out to the Amazon, the ACX website, and everything that I'm teaching you today is freely available there. You can go through and they'll give you all the specs um, that your recordings have to meet in order to be eligible for upload and resale through Audible. You can distribute your own stuff through uh, outlets like iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud. Um, this is the point I was going to make about Amazon. I mean, we tend to think of them as the devil for what they're doing to uh, local retailers. But that, that's the same technology that has democratized the artistic process for all of us. We have access to tools now for pennies of a dollar that used to cost you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and they were all controlled by gatekeepers. The radio stations, TV stations, movie studios, the big publishing companies of books and newspapers. You had to get to one gatekeeper to get through that system, and then they would grant you access to all of their expensive tools. Now Adobe has given us access to all that without without having to go through any of the gatekeepers at all. So, the, but that puts the responsibility on us then to have the energy and the persistence to understand what the tools do and how we can make them work for us. Here's some of the things about uh, Amazon. Uh, you can do mono or stereo in your file. All they ask, they say mono is preferred. You can do stereo, all they ask is that when you upload an audio book that you stick to one format all the way through. Because if you change, like you've got your voice clip here, and then you've got a sound effect or a little bit of transitional music or something in stereo, that's going to be very disruptive to the listener. And so again, think about the audio materials that you consume and what's made it harder or easier for you to enjoy them. And those are the reasons why these standards exist, because they want your material to be accessible and sticky enough with your audience that they're going to come back to you to buy more. So I'll, I won't get into all the frequencies and those different types of things, but all those settings are readily available. And as you upload your material, um, Amazon and Audible will guide you through every step. It's just, it's very, very simple. It just takes a little courage to get out of your comfort zone, you know, and, and kind of experience those things step by step. We'll talk about more of those in the next hour if you come back. You're going to run into obstacles. I love Neil Gaiman. If you ever get a chance, uh, put him down on YouTube and watch the commencement address that he gave in 2012 at University of the Arts. It's one of the friendliest and most welcoming invitation to being an artist that I've ever heard. So he summarizes over and over again under different settings. He said, when things get tough, make good art. Don't let any of these things scare you or be a barrier. To, to, the most important thing is just to pick it up and try. Let's say that your audio book doesn't get accepted right away. Or let's say you're still writing your book and you don't exactly have a finished product yet. There's lots of other ways into doing voice work. I got onto KVAQ after a few years out of the radio business and in the corporate world. I was able to break back in because they had a reading service for the blind. And the, vis and the visually impaired, they weren't all just blind blind. Um, so all popular books, periodicals, magazines, newspapers, um, 
they, they would have readers come in. And so I just went in and volunteered you know, a few nights a week. And uh, I just read the news cold from USA Today uh, during this live show. And it was wonderful practice. But, but I made friends with people at the sister stations that were next door. And I got a chance to audition for a paid on air job. Um, podcasting is wide open. Yeah, there's 400,000 of them. But there's one thing that none of those 4,000 400,000 existing podcasts have right now. Do you know what that is? Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's your perspective, your insight, your take on life. And there's every good reason why people should be able to see the world through your eyes as well as mine, or David Sedaris's. So you just need a fresh angle and, and make it personal. Um, you can do webinars. If, let's say um, that your, your book isn't ready, but you've had a lot of experience in you know, working with editors, or as an editor, working with writers. Uh, Michael Hyatt has made a whole career um, from his former chairmanship at Thomas Nelson Publishing on how to get editors to read your book and how to do a winning book proposal. You can take an area of expertise, do a PowerPoint slideshow of it, or, or a keynote, or whatever you use. Lay down just a very simple soundtrack over it with a USB uh, microphone that you can get for like 50 bucks and put them up on YouTube, start a channel, and begin to get noticed that way. And the first ones that you do are gonna be crap. <laughs> Just accept that, but do them anyway. Get the first one out there, you'll learn from the previous one, and the next one will get better and better and better. That was advice that Bob Seeger had when the Eagles were just kids rooming in this cheap apartment in LA. They hadn't even really formed as a band yet. And Bob Seeger told the late Glenn Fry, write a lot of songs. He said, you're going to write a ton of bad ones. He said, but it's, it's just the only way to get better. Um, social media is, is a great uh, way to get in. Um, you can put things up on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. You can do a visual version of it on Pinterest that leads back to your YouTube channel, for example. And you can start to build a list and following that way. And maybe, like, if you have two or three slideshows, give away episode one in exchange for somebody's email to build your list. And then, you know, charge them, like, $1.99 for episodes, you know, two, three, and four. I mean, there's all kinds of little team ways in, and you can just get a trickle going in PayPal or something to, to do that. And they give you a button that you can stick on a WordPress site, you know, which you can set up basically for free, except for you know, whatever hosting costs you. There's ways that you can build these little catchment systems and start to fund. And you know, the, re the revenue from that can maybe go towards your gear. You can start for as little as $300. Digital audio workstations like uh, uh, UJAM, Audio Tools is a cloud-based one. You can get those for free. And the downside of that is that they're going to hit you up with ads all the time. To, you know, to add features or upgrade to their pro version. But you can do everything you need to do on a free uh, digital audio workstation. If you don't have a computer, go get an Acer Chromebook for like 150 bucks there <coughs> on Amazon. And they have enough snort that you can run, you can run the cloud-based digital audio workstation and save all your files out in the cloud for, for next to nothing. Um, headphones, you don't need really great ones. Um, audio Technica, I think it's the ATER. Oh, that's the microphone. Uh, the microphone is uh, the ATR2100. You can get for like somewhere between $60 and $70. It'll plug straight into your computer. You don't need a digital recorder or mixer or any of that stuff to get started. It's nice to have, but you don't have to have it to get going. Uh, the headphones are the ATH M40X, and it sounds as good as the Sony's that I use. You, you won't really be able to hear a difference with the rest of this gear. I think, I think I'm out of time. I've got maybe five minutes. Um, there's some resources here. These are the people that actually should be up here talking to you instead of me. But uh, I'm lucky that I got the spot today, and I feel very grateful. I appreciate your warm and receptive energy. I recommend all of these books if you haven't found them yet. These were, I put these on here because they were transformative for me. Uh, Bird by Bird by Emma Mott. None of these really specifically address audio or podcasting except Crush It. 
Gary Vaynerchuk goes into a lot of detail about how he started his wine, uh, I forget what he called it now, but it was like a video podcast that basically transformed his family business from this little niche liquor store in New Jersey to this booming internet business. And no production values, it was just a webcam, you could see him lean over to turn it on. <coughs> and that guy built a following that was just crazy. He tells you every step of the way how he did it in that Crush It book, and then also gives you inspiration on how you can start these little micro businesses of your own to get going. More resources, I mentioned the retailers. Uh, I've had really good uh, results with B&H, uh, Sam Ash, Musician's Friend, is right here in town. Um, also Broadcast Supply, and straight up Amazon. Um, if you want to find some tutorials, he charges kind of a lot for them, but he does give away some free stuff. There's a guy named Cliff Ravenscraft, and he calls himself the Podcast Answer Man, and that's, the, that's actually the URL that you would use to find his stuff. If you, want, if you have a little bit more budget, and you've got some throughput going in your arts business already, and want to spend a little more, he's got some good equipment recommendations there. Adobe tutorials. Find them and use them. They're great. I use Adobe uh, uh, Audition primarily for my sound editing because it's part of my uh, Creative Cloud subscription through work. The guys who run just before me recommend Avid Pro Tools um, as you know, kind of the industry standard for audio production. And that's what they use like for NPR and big broadcast houses everywhere. It's prohibitively expensive for somebody trying to break in, but if you've got a dream of doing, being an audio producer, eventually you're going to want to get Pro Tools under your fingers and at least be familiar with it. But get somebody to hire you who will pay for your training, <laughs> so you don't have to buy it. Linda.com. Um, so I used up almost all the time, but if you have any questions for me, we've got just a couple of minutes. I think they want me out of here in about four minutes. What are you doing for your second uh, presentation? Second presentation is called Soundtracks in Audiobooks, and it's essentially a continuation of this one, but I get into more specifics on the production and some editing techniques and making choices with music beds and um, just how to put the albums together for a, a soundtrack. So this was more theory, and, and the next hour will be more practice. What else? Is, is this going to be recorded? It has been recorded, and I think I think the uh, the one in the next hour, you know. Yes. Good, because I can't take care of it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I got to meet you. I'll I'll send you off with this. And for, oh yeah, what's your thought? Oh, um, is Audacity a DAW? Yes, program? digital okay. audio workstation. Audacity is fine. I've used it. Um, be careful where you get it because I got a ton of malware. The one that I got, and it took me months to clean it off. But. Um, it is, uh, a lot of people use it, and it's inexpensive to free. So if you're just getting started, most of the principles that you learn in any digital audio workstation, you'll be able to apply it in any other one that you pick up. Okay, I'll leave you with this. Again, in that commencement address, I heard this and I loved it. He was talking to the kids in the audience of this graduating class and saying, you know, there's three rules that are going to get you by as an artist. And of course, remember before this, he just kept telling them over and over again, make good art, no matter what's happening. Your wife runs off with a politician, make good art. Um, so the first one is do good work. Do the best you can. You, you have to start somewhere. All you can do is begin where you are with what you have. Be easy to get along with. And then deliver the work on time. And he said, here's the best news of all. You only have to do two out of three to really make it. If you're a complete jerk, but you do good work, and you deliver it on time, they'll put up with you. If you're always late, but you do great work and you're easy to get along with, they'll, they'll continue to send you more jobs. He went on like that. But really, I think these are the keys to success that go far beyond any tools or technology. It's really just having the drive to get there. And I want to say that you're wanted, you're welcome. You're invited. Come on. This is a continuation of
what we started the first hour on audiobooks and voiceovers. So in the first session, I was focusing mainly on voice and just kind of general outlines of the business. In this hour, uh, I'm going to be focusing more on hands-on kind of practical stuff. Uh, but since we're all friends and we're kind of floating between groups, I'm happy to jump around and adapt the material. And uh, I'll try to leave more time for Q&A this time than I did last hour. But we had a ton of introductory stuff to get through. So, um, any thoughts from the last, for those that were here for the, the last hour, do you, uh, was there any impressions that stood out to you or anything that I didn't cover that you wish I had covered in the first hour? Yeah, that's uh, uh, My name is Laura. Laura, hi, Tim. I also have a bachelor's degree in film, just so you're not alone. Uh, but uh, uh, I have a lot of degrees, uh, and uh, my question was, how many hours from uh, does it take between the recording and editing to produce one hour of finished product? Typically, it varies anywhere from. Uh, it, for me, average is about four to one. Um, I mean, that's like writing the material, wrangling all the talent, sitting down, and, you know, doing the initial recording session and then going through it to scrub it and package it. So, um, if you have a workflow set up for a podcast, let's say, you can shorten that dramatically if you do stuff in batches. Like, um, for instance, for the podcast that I'm starting now for StorageCraft, I'm planning on doing all of my interviews in one day. So I'm going to line them all up and just, I'm going to book, I book an entire day and get all my subject matter experts back to back to back. And then I take that raw footage and I have a day for editing and then a day for um, getting it uh, packaged and encoded and uploaded. So, um, but for just day to day, like one off projects that aren't repetitive, it can take, I, I, I've spent as much as four hours for one finished job. That, it may be different for other people. That's my workflow. Hi, what, tell me your name. Uh, I'm Cal Spears. Cal, uh, just from the author perspective, uh, I wanted to admit to that. From ACX, they pay per finished hour, so it's, it's an important distinction if you're approaching it from the narration perspective of saying, oh, well, it's, it's only 12 hours, you know, maybe $250 an hour. That's great, but that's per finished hour, so if it takes you 10 hours to do that one, yeah, yeah, there is there is definitely some sweat equity involved in this. And then there was something over here. I didn't want to exclude anybody. Is there another thought? Okay, let's get going. So this is part two, uh, a little bit more hands-on. For those that didn't get it last hour, there's my personal email. If there's anything that we don't address today that's really important to you, um, I, I welcome the idea of continuing this conversation uh, after after today, and I can probably address bigger subjects more in depth with you by email than we can do it in a sound bite here. So if that works for you, then please uh, feel welcomed. You can also uh, get to me on LinkedIn to McDonald, and if you send me a connection request, I'll accept it, and then we can do um, direct messages there as well. So whatever platform is good for you. I always like to know who I'm talking to. So uh, for this hour, uh, we're going to be focusing more on the tools and equipment and kind of production specifics. So I'd just like to know uh, how many in the room right now would rate yourself as advanced with working with audio tools or doing your own voice work? Anybody considers themselves advanced? Or, oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot better. You're sandbagging me, but <laughs> I'm advanced. <laughs> You can turn it on and get an audio file out the other end. Okay, good. So, how about intermediate? Some experience? Okay. Oh, what is your name? Uh, my name is Andrew. Andrew, were you here last hour? Nope. Okay. Well, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I gave a little bit of my background in the other session, and I'll, I'll drop some bits in. I don't want to waste your engagement time with, with my personal history, but I'll answer any questions you want. Basically worked as a broadcaster, I've worked in advertising, so I've had a lot of radio experience, some TV experience, um, I've worked on film crews, uh, doing audio and extra work and stuff like that. So, uh, right now I work for a software company, 
and I do, they call me a content marketing director, so I do all their uh, podcasts and ebooks and webinars and slide shares and uh, voice tracks for corporate videos and that sort of stuff. So it beats working for me. Uh -huh. so, um, okay, then how many would rank themselves as a beginner? Okay, quite a few. Okay, well, that helps me, and that's nothing to be shy about. Everybody is a beginner at some point, and that just helps me to kind of gear. You know my material, so it's going to be most relevant to you. There's also always somebody that's better. <laughs> yeah. I'm only a little bit better, and I don't even consider myself better. As what I told the group in the last hour, and for those, that's, this is a repetition, I apologize, um, but I really have just been to that country maybe a time or two more than you, so I just know more of the back streets. And if you follow me and do it yourself, then you'll know them too. So I'm absolutely not any smarter than you. I just have. Uh, a little more time in the chair. So I want to set the tone at the beginning, and I did mention this last hour, the point of everything that we're going to talk about is to focus on your audience, your reader, your listener, and we want to do everything we can to keep them in the story. And so that means subtracting everything from the audio book, the soundtrack, the narration that you do, um, that, that's going to be distracting to them whether it's system noise, or ticks in your voice, or little artifacts in the recording, and I'm going to show you how to get rid of those today. Um, we want to do everything we can to minimize distractions and just make it as easy as possible for them to stay in the world that you create. What you do with their emotions after that is up to you. But we're just, we're just part of we're just one of the collaborating departments in these media experiences, and um, my film friends here <laughs> know that better than I do. That it takes, you know, it takes a whole army of skill sets and multidisciplinary creatives to actually go through that entire birthing process for the movie or the radio show or whatever it is. We're just one department whose job it is to make it easy for our audience to suspend disbelief for a little while. So everything that we talk about for the next 40, 50 minutes or so is going to be about keeping them in the story. That's why we do all of this. Let's talk about music for a second. When you're building a soundtrack, often um, music becomes an element. For audiobooks, it's not, it's usually just dry narrative. But for different transitions, like the chapter headings or the opening billboard where you'll do the title and the author and the credits, a lot of times they use a little music bed in there. If you're doing an industrial soundtrack, something for a corporate video, or let's say just a slide share, some kind of energetic promotional video. Let's say you want to make a trailer for your book, you know, before you even do the audio version. You want to get it out there on your YouTube channel or on Facebook or you know, whatever <coughs> social uh, platform that you use. A lot of times uh, music beds are going to really help um, to establish a position for your story in the mind of the listener because you can say a lot with the music <coughs> that you don't have to cram into the script. How often and how annoying is it when you're watching a movie or a TV show and the dialogue is just so sickeningly on the nose. The character is telling you everything that you already see happening on the screen. Right? It's ridiculous. You don't want to minimize the action because they can already infer something from the action on the screen. So the dialogue and the sound that you put in there should tell them something that they don't already know from the visual that's in the picture. Uh, for an audio-only uh, situation, uh, an audio book, you can sprinkle in some sound effects or some music or you don't have to say it was a dark and stormy night. You can say that with a spooky music bed and get right to the point of the scene. So these are ways that soundtracks in general, and music beds in particular, can help you give more uh, emphasis to your story. So there's elements of music, and you've probably heard, uh, I heard more of this in Utah than I've heard anywhere else. The local commercials just drive me insane. <laughs> <laughs> if you've made any of them, I apologize. I'm, I, I moved here from a different market, and it's been a little bit of a culture shock for me over the last two or three years. But it seems like every commercial, whether it's uh, 
a bank or farm equipment or a car dealer, they've got that same guy whistling in some little happy Jiminy Cricket tune in the back of the <laughs> <laughs> I just want to throw my shoe through the television. Why is he so damn cheerful? <laughs> I don't really feel that way. But there is a time and a place for different moods in music. And so that, these are the things that when you're selecting a music bed for your project, be, try to be more mindful about the listening that you do. And when you hear commercials or when you hear music beds that are beneath other types of audio material, try if you can to pay attention to the tempo of the music. Do you find that the, the speed and the, the nature of the beat itself enhances the narrative, or does it distract you from it? Um, look at the, pay attention to the texture of the music, the, the, in, the instrumentation, you know, how many layers does it have? The, the sound of the instruments, do, does it enhance the voice and cradle it, or does it subtract from it? Again, all of these things have to do with keeping your, your listener in the story, in, in the movie as much as possible. I just wanted to mention tempo is, is a really big thing. There's a, a presentation on Saturday about the anatomy of a number one hit song. Yes. And in that session, it talks about uh, that you match the beats per minute in the song to the heart rate for your intended use. Okay, so if it's elevator music, you're 60 beats per minute, stuff like that. If you're, you want to dance, you're 120 to 130 beats per minute. Things like that. So, so you focus. If you're creating, you you want to focus on those kind of things. Yeah, and absolutely. More specific details. Who's, and, who's the presenter for that? Do you remember? Me. <laughs> what time? Um, what time Saturday? This is about <laughs> Well, everything that you're going to explain that day really reinforces what we're talking about here. So, if you can fit it in, it would be hugely valuable. And there's going to be a live recording uh, improv recording process for part of that, for part of that presentation. So, okay. Well, what do you think of uh, canned music, royalty three, three canned music or effects? Or like on Final Cut Pro, I think you take sound bites and create something you ever use in the US? I do, yeah. I've used loops to build up uh, things and I use them for just little accentuators and stingers at different points in the, in the, in the piece. And so you can use it to really highlight an important phrase in the narrative, definitely. Um, there's good and bad ones, um, and so royalty-free, you know, it, it kind of implies that you get what you pay for. I've used a company, um, uh, Cal, I haven't forgotten you, um, I've used a company called Music Bakery, and they tend to be kind of a cut above um, a lot of the royalty-free stuff that's out there. It's, it's a pretty big business now, and that's, that makes it a buyer's market because that gives us a lot of choice about who we work with. Um, I, I wish I had like a silver bullet or a shortcut for you, but all I can say is audition as many as you can and check them out and go with the one. You're going to pay, like for a buyout, for a, a track that you're going to use a lot, you can pay anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks and it'll come in like a whole original song. You, you should. It, whatever you buy, the track you get should come in a variety of lengths. So you want a whole song, you want a 60 second cut, or a 30 second cut, and a 10 second cut. But um, it's going to be more expensive to do it that way, but until you get comfortable with editing music yourself, I just buy the, the full version now, and I make my own 30s and 60s out of it because I've been trained in music and I can hear the spots and I can slice it up how I want. But, the downside of that is it's kind of labor intensive. So um, they have packages now where they, they've done it for you and all those links are done. Music Bakery, I know in particular, does it. And they their stuff tends to sound less cheesy than the typical library cuts that you're going to get. Um, but the license to the free ones inside the applications and the editors that you're using can be perfectly good. All I would say is just use them sparingly because everybody has those. And, you know, It'll make your it'll make your project sound emulative if you use it too much. Uh, sorry, I got a little tangent there. Cal, what's your thought? Uh, I was just going to ask about sources for music. Can you mention that? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the one that I've used the most and have the best results. Um, their stuff tends to sound a little more original than average, and um, so I recommend that. 
So there's different song, soundtrack elements that are going to go into any particular project. <coughs> the first piece is going to be the basic tracks that you record. And so if you're doing film, uh, I'm sorry, tell me your name again in the middle. Me? Yes. What? Laura. Laura, I'm sorry. Great thing. I apologize. So, uh, Laura and Arlo will both have experience with this where you're out on a movie location or in a, in a studio setting. And these, they're going to be the basic tracks. They will either call it natural sound or the wild tracks. But it's essentially whatever you get on scene. In the radio business, they call them actualities. So this is the senator explaining where he found the smoking gun that got the cabinet minister thrown out. And, um, those are, so those are, it's, it's essentially your main subject of the project. And in many cases, that's going to be you. You're just getting your basic voice tracks, recording your narration, or whatever you want to say about your slide share, or it's going to be you know, how many chapters of your book that you do. So then, there's a process that um, audio engineers call sweetening. And they'll take those basic tracks, and first they'll do some uh, uh, processing on it. And then, uh, so they'll add things called uh, compression, and maybe some filtering to enhance uh, qualities of the human voice to you know, make that optimal for the spoken word, uh, in our case. Uh, and then maybe some sound effects as appropriate. So you want to just add something very subtle, nothing overpowering, but maybe it's birds, maybe it's crickets, maybe it's a waterfall, something, you know, barnyard animals, whatever it is that's going to help you um, put your readers in the scene. And again, we're using that as an, as an auditory cue so that we don't have to put all that stuff into the narrative. Now the interesting thing about the human brain, and I learned this a long time ago actually working in radio, the reason that you and I can listen to a radio commercial that has a jingle underneath it and make sense of it all is because the parts of our brain that process music and process language are actually separate from one another. I don't know how separate, I'm not a brain physiologist, but I do know that we process music and language differently. And that's why in our heads we're able to merge that thing into one message. So our job as audio producers is to figure out adding, how to add just enough music or sound effect enhancement to add to the narrative and not distract from it. So if you can say, well, it was a rainy day and the, the uh, horses were restless, instead of putting that in your narrator's dialogue, you can just throw that underneath and the person will just instinctively get that. Um, if you, I, I talked in the last session about learning opportunities. You know, take advantage of all the, the Adobe tutorials you can because they're free and they show you to how to work every little menu button in every one of their applications. It's, it's really uh, kind of a hidden gem. But another place to get free learning, and I'm hoping that I'm with the right crowd for this, Nick, is that uh, I was, I've been a DVD junkie for a while. I know DVDs are old Smithsonian technology now. But I became a junkie for all the special features. I would buy the box that had the most bonus discs in it. And I would sit there and I would watch the movie. I, if there were five commentaries, I would sit and watch the movie five times and take notes. And you hear the guy from Skywalker Sound telling you that when he needs the sound of you know the alien eating the guts of some victim, you know that he said his wife's cheese casserole was actually the very best sound effect to what he could find. This is not a joke. He really did this. He brought a dish of it into the studio and mic'd it. And then he'd sit there and he'd reach in there and he'd grab like several loops of it. And he would drop that in whenever something disgusting was happening on the screen. And it was brilliant. One of the favorites is watching the old time radio sound effects guy. The yeah. Same guy with all the news. Awesome. You can see that now, um, Prairie Home Companion. Actually, there's a guy that does that. And if you watch some of their uh, NPR, or American Public Media, I forget, PRI, I forget who it is. But um, 
Uh, they actually have a guy on stage doing that during all their live radio recordings, and it's really fun to see what he does. That's a hoot. Um, but yeah, that's why they used to call radio theater of mind. And you can look back, um, if, if you want to look at like some of these subtle uh, layering techniques and how you know less is more with all these little incremental effects that you had, go back and look for, um, there's a guy, you, I'm sure you'll find his clips on YouTube, Stan Freeberg was great at it, um, and another guy named Dick Orkin. His commercials, radio commercials around the LA area were absolutely hilarious. And he just made tons of money from his client because he wasn't just funny for funny's sake, which is a mistake that a lot of advertisers and creatives make. It's like, oh, I'm going to win an award. And oh, yeah, remember that thing where the guy did that and whatever? He did? What product was that for? Yeah, I don't know. So you, they make the mistake of being so good that people remember the story, but they don't remember the product. But Dick Orkin and Stan Freeberg, these are like old school guys from the 80s, the 70s, the 60s. And they were masters at this whole theater of the mind technique where they could put these subtle enhancements in under uh, what you and I would consider to be a very, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, voice track. And it would really come alive because you'd actually start to see what was happening inside your head. What was that name? You got Stan Freeberg and Dick Orkin. He used to have this um, kind of a comedy series called The Chicken Man that they would run on some LA radio stations. He might have been syndicated for a while. But Dick Orkin, like the bug, you know, the exterminators, yeah, and uh, he was brilliant. When I first started writing commercials for a living, I listened to everything he did, and I copied his style. Stan Freeberg was great. I don't. They probably told you in film school, get into a scene as late as you possibly can, and get out as early as possible. And Stan Freeberg, on the audio side, remember, he had nothing visual to fall back on. He was a master of that, and he was the one who pioneered um, the idea of, of starting the listener in the middle of a conversation. It's like you've dropped in on a conversation that's already happening. They didn't you know, lead you through all this preamble and setup like I'm doing right now. And uh, it, it was really amazing because it, it hooked your attention immediately. It's like you're dropping in on something you're not supposed to hear. It's like, what do you mean? You dropped all the tea in the water. You have no idea what happened just before that, but it's like, oh, yeah, why did he do that? And um, so these are all techniques and cheats that you can use with audio to make your material uh, more relevant, more sticky, more compelling for your audience. If you listen to all those uh, special features on the DVDs, you'll find that most of the mainstream sound designers for Hollywood, you, you listen to these soundtracks in epic films like um, you know, The Lord of the Rings and uh, or like all the stuff that happens in Game of Thrones, you know, more, more uh, currently. Typically, the sound designers will only use about three major elements in layering the sound for any particular scene. So they'll do something to establish uh, ambience, to help reinforce whatever's happening on the screen, and just give it that subtle enhancement. And then there'll maybe be like one little featured sound, like it would be clanking of machinery, or and then you know something to establish whether it's wet or dry, day or night, indoors, outdoors, that kind of thing. Um, any more than three uh, becomes unmanageable in the mix, and it's it's ultimately going to be wasted because it's just going to get so garbled and jumbled together um, that if you're going to add any kind of sweetening or sound effects, you've got the music bed and then maybe two, maybe one or two other ambient effects over that, and that's all that your listener is really going to be able to process. So use that stuff sparingly. Let's talk about editing for a minute. So once you have all your basic tracks in place and you've decided what you're going to use, if, if sweetening is appropriate, and whether you're going to use music or sound effects to add to that, you're going to have to edit everything. So what is it that you're going to have to edit? And all that's going to happen in your digital audio software. Um, when I came up in the radio business, I started in 84. And I learned how to edit sound with, uh, with a magnetic tape using grease pencils and razor blades. And I am a master at that skill, which is now completely irrelevant. <laughs> 
pissed off that I wasted all those hours. Because now you can do it with a mouse click. Um, but it's brilliant. And so everything that you see in a digital audio workstation today is going to mimic those manual functions. So you're going to rock the tape back and forth. You're going to find the exact edit point that you want. And then you're going to make the cut and just splice it together with the other piece that you want it to connect to. So what are the reasons that we're going to want to edit? So everything that you do now, once you have all your raw material, um, Laura, Laura and, and uh, Orlo would call this principal photography when that's all done. Now you've got to take it back to the edit suite and get it ready for consumption. So you're going to want to edit for time in some cases. For an audio book, that's really not that big of a concern. Uh, if you're going to upload an audio book uh, to Amazon, for example, they require that your files be no bigger than so many megabytes. I forget the number. I have it on another slide. I'll show you. And they don't want it to be any longer than 120 minutes. So any individual chapter, your billboard, your prologue, chapter 1 through 31, you know, whatever that is, and your closing credits, none of them, those all have to be separate files. And none of them can be longer than 120 minutes. So um, in an audio book, that's the only reason that you have to edit for time. Uh, for uh, like YouTube videos and slide shares and the like, um, some time is a little bit more of a constraint because of the average viewer's attention span. So um, you've got probably six seconds to really grab their interest. And if they don't see something relevant really to them in the first minute, they're going to click away. So you want to try to keep things you know, that are just introductory you know, top of the funnel where you're just bringing people in to engage with your business initially, you know, try to keep it around in one to two minutes. Um, so that's another reason to edit for time. And you'll be, oh yeah, well, is that for broadcasting? I mean, if you're doing an audio book and they're buying it on a collection of CDs, would that make a difference? Yeah, for, for that, and that, that's what I was saying a minute ago, that you've got a lot more leeway there because it's all, the 120 minutes is a technical constraint. That's the, uh, Amazon and Audible can't support the file any longer than that. Uh, but other than that, there's no there's no time constraint. It's not like in a commercial, <coughs> uh, 45 minutes for programming and 15 minutes for commercials. You know, I mean, there was reasons why they had yes length, but if it's something that they're sliding into the machine and listening to it and, and you turn the car off. It stops and it starts again and starts again. Exactly. You don't have those no, there's no constraint there other than the length, the, just the file size that whatever platform will support. But other than that, time's not a concern. You're absolutely right. It's also the upload and download speed. If you have a, a file that's more than 120 minutes, it's going to take hours possibly to upload it. And then it's going to take the person listening to it, it's going to take a long time for them to download it. So they won't be happy. So. Yeah. So yeah, the only time that time is a real serious constraint is if you're doing stuff for broadcast, which you know most of us won't do. Um, and Earl's right that that's a very rigid prescription that you have to hit. And so for a you know, 60 second commercial, technically you only get 59 and a half seconds uh, because there's little time and other stuff, and it's 29 and a half for a 30 second spot. And um, for NPR. Um, they have 15 second underwrites, and so if you have to write to hit those really tight time posts, you want to allow for your announcer, or if it's you, um, about 120 words a minute average, and then just divide it by the number of seconds that you have to figure out your word count. And you'll be amazed, you know, you think that you, you write this block of text and you think every word in it is essential, and when you know that you've got to shave off two and a half more seconds, You'll be surprised what you can let go of in a pinch. And you realize, oh, I can get that idea across in one word instead of three. Or I can use a shorter word. You know? And um, so that was one of the greatest things about being in the radio business for me was having to write commercials eight hours a day. It had to fit that window. And it, it just helped me to get a lot more ruthless about cutting my own stuff. And I, I started falling a lot less in love with my own. Rich. You take it out of the passive voice and put it in active voice, it almost always makes it shorter Definitely. and clearer as well. Yeah. We can do it, uh, we can do it all day on passive voice, that's out of my scope here, but yeah, we must kill it. 
So, uh, so we edit for time. Uh, another uh, reason to edit is for noise. Uh, there's things in the scene that, that are distracting and you want to get them out. And then um, to, to add in effects and make sure that the mix of the effects is just right. You want, for example, you want the music bed just loud enough to enhance the scene, but not so loud that um, it distracts from your voice track, which is the main point, obviously. So when you're, when you're doing a mix, you want, it's best to have the music just turned off for an instant and get the volume, the optimum volume level set for the voice, and then bring the music up gradually until it's just nestled under there. And this is going to involve a lot of trial and error. There's no absolute room, uh, rule for this because it's going to depend on the, the tempo, the instrumentation, you know, the texture of the music, the style, all of that um, is going to affect the mix. So you've got to make that judgment call as you go. This is what an audio editing window looks like. In, uh, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. it um, this is what the audio editing window looks like in Adobe Premiere, uh, which is what I use. Uh, you're going to find a very similar way to an editor in just about any digital audio workstation that you work with, whether it's Audition or um, Audio Tools. Um, Avid Pro Tools, again, is you know, the industry standard. And if you're going to be a broadcaster, eventually you're going to have to get familiar with Avid products. But um, it, Adobe works just fine for me, and it's compatible. I can pull these tracks in and out of Adobe Premiere. Yeah? I use Adobe Premiere, but I don't quite get it for audiobooks. Because for audiobooks, don't we need kind of a marker that tells people it's the next chapter? Um, maybe not. I don't know. Would well, you there is, there is a do-it-yourself discipline for that if you're going to self-publish. But if you do it through Audible, all they need is the file for each chapter. And they actually put the markers and the breaks in. See, I've never done it, so that's great advice. Because I've been like, yeah. just sweating over it. Like, like, oh, don't remember really well, but I, I just assumed there was some special thing See, I had to do for that. So I just upload each chapter to ACS. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And um, they give you all the standards on there just to make sure that all your settings are right in Premiere. So it's like 44.1 kilohertz and... Oh, good. So the output they give you just real specific. Yeah, it's all there. And, and it's, in, in Premiere, it's really easy. And actually, once you set it that way, it'll stay there on every project until awesome. you change it. So mm -hmm. their, yeah. their workspace is really intuitive. Yeah, right. yeah. So it's very simple. So um, this is what the waveform editor looks like. And after a while, you'll be able to begin to spot um, like the consonants, that really wide uh, swath right in the middle of the screen there after the blank space. <coughs> That's probably a K or a P or a T or something like that. And so um, if you're going to cut sections out, let's say that you misspoke and you wanted to do a retake, you can just do a pickup. And then you can cut, you're going to get better results if you cut from consonant to consonant. So you want some kind of hard plosive sound to anchor off uh, because that artifact is, is going to be, it's hard to, I don't really know the audio physics of it, but it's going to be far less perceptible to your listener than if you cut in the middle of a long vowel sound because there's so many variations in the human voice that we might not say A or O or something, you know, an extensible vowel in the same way. Um, every time, and it's going to be really noticeable that you cut there. So if you can go from uh, consonant to consonant or some other hard artifact in the sound, your edits are going to be a lot less noticeable to even imperceptible. Um, so and like when you're editing music, you want to do something like on a you know, kick drum and snare, you know, not like on a long cymbal splash or a violin, you know, a, a long note on a violin. Those are going to really stick out. Um, so if you can avoid sustained notes and really cut on hard the bits. Um, your edits are going to be a lot cleaner and a lot less noticeable. Always, 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 when you record voice tracks of any kind, make sure to leave a little time where you're just doing nothing and just get room tone, what they call room tone in there. Because there's things happening in this room right now because we have selective attention. Just a normal conversation, you're not going to notice, but there's a whir from the fan on that thing, there's hum from the lights, there's going to be a little low frequency rumble from outside. Your microphone is going to pick up all of that. You'll hear everything. So real quick on that subject, um, what do you do as far as soundproofing? Do you get a full-on booth or do you just get a shield? Or 
this year? They have like little rounded shields that you can just put the microphone inside and it's kind of like an acoustic shell and that'll help project a lot of ambient noise from the room. I don't, I've never bought one, but maybe you have. The one that you guys use in training, I don't know how expensive that one. I don't think they're prohibitively expensive. I've been on film shoots where I just put C stands up and draped movie blankets over it. I mean, moving blankets, and it was perfectly fine. You don't need expensive treatments. If you're just doing it at home, um, beach towels, in a pillow, just nearby where you are. If you're doing a podcast or something like that, where you're going to be actually appearing in the scene on your webcam or whatever, like a video podcast, please use a box or something to elevate your laptop so that you're at eye level with the webcam. Otherwise, it's going to look like you know, it's going to look weird to your viewer. So you want to uh, position yourself in front of the webcam as if you're face to face. But um, if you have a walk-in closet, I've lost count of the number of recordings I've done at home just in my walk-in closet, and all your shirts and pants hang in there will be enough to get the clothes. <laughs> dead clothes. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, it doesn't have to be expensive. I'll show you a picture of my studio in a minute where we just used burlap and insulation and just made some really cheap one by frames and hung them up like pictures. And it flattened out the room just like that. It's really Another nice. thing, just real quick, if, if you want, if you're handy, you just get a couple of bifold doors, you get burlap, sew it together, turn it into a sock, and then do um, acoustic insulate, insulation. It's about 13, 20, 13, 15 dollars. You fold it over, put the thing over it, and then you just stand it up. Around it. I've got that in my studio home, and it, it works really, really, really well, and it's very inexpensive. I'm glad that wasn't the five minute guy. <laughs> so here's an expanded view. Uh, in most of these digital audio workstations, I'll show you the comparison here. That's the, the whole clip. And now here it is stretched out in zoom mode. So you can isolate little pieces of it. Um, it's kind of in a dark spot on the screen. Right here, there's a little jagged curly cue. And that's probably me clearing my throat or making some kind of weird noise with my nose hairs or something. <laughs> so in this expanded view, you can find all this. Uh, when I talked about the room tone, um, you're going to find it in these sections here. Now, it doesn't show, unfortunately. I apologize. I just had to grab some examples on the fly. But this is a section where I've already taken it out. Um, but you want to grab a section like this in an Adobe Premiere there's a menu item that says capture noise. You're back! Uh, uh, that says capture noise print. And that's what you can do. You can take the noise print of all those things that you think are silence, but they're not, that will all be there in the background. That there'll be a digital print of it. And what you can do in Adobe Premiere is uh, use a noise reduction tool, and it'll take that noise print, and it'll subtract all of it out of your entire track. Oh, you are the five minute guy. You, you psyched me out. That was a head fake, man. Um, so you can subtract all of that out, and it just leaves you with really clean audio. So to your point, yeah, you know, give yourself the most favorable environment you can, but with the digital tools that you have now, you can take out a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Another thing really quick, um, some of the applications, they also have a, a function that's called remove silence. And so it will go through and it will automatically slice out the actual part of the audio file that is silent. And so when you actually create your, your audio file, it makes it much smaller. So you still get the exact same sound, but it, it helps reduce your file sizes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, I would say use that with caution because there's times where you want a little bit of silence for effect or you know for pause and delivery and things like that, especially with an audiobook where you're reading it with uh, the pace and inflection that you want your audience to get. And it doesn't take time out, it doesn't shrink it, it just removes the audio space and it leaves everything else in the same position. Nice, that's so, great. Yeah. Okay, so here's where I highlighted the nose here. And then you can do just a simple delete, and it pops that right out of there. So you can do that with um, extraneous breaths. If you clear your throat, if you do a false start and start a word over again, it's a very simple matter. To, you, can, you can get this under your fingers and learn a couple of keyboard shortcuts. 
And you can go through and do a scrub edit on your whole clip really fast, just with a little bit of practice. Um, here's where I was illustrating where that's the, where you grab the silence to capture the noise print. Uh, and then it'll subtract it out for you automatically. You can't really see, but um, sorry, again, the screen is really dim. But this gives you a visual reference. Up here, where this blue line is, that's, that's the level where your wanted audio is. And this fuzzy green stuff down here is the noise floor. And so what it does is subtract that out so you get less noise and more signal than you want. And it's just a couple of mouse clicks. It's really wonderful and very easy. There's also an alternative view. That's great for just ambient sounds that are continuous. What about something like uh, somebody slams a door in the middle of your take and you don't, it was perfect, and you don't want to redo it? Adobe Premiere and uh, some of the other ones will give you this uh, spectral display where you can actually, by rocking it back, rocking the playhead back and forth, and when I say playhead, I'm talking about this faint red line and that blue thing right there. That blue thing, you can think of it as like the little metallic playhead that used to be on the old analog tape recorders. And imagine the tape that we like. That's what that represents. Well, by rocking, by scooting that back and forth with your mouse or with your um, control keys, you can actually hear where that door slam is. You can grab an eraser from over here from the toolbar. <coughs> you can bless you. You can scrub out just that little bit, and it doesn't disturb any of the rest of the audio that you want to keep. So that's another really good thing. If you want to save the take, and you're in a hurry. Okay, getting close to the end. All of this can look daunting at first, but the key to everything is just get started. Just get started. Begin where you are with what you have. You're going to learn as you go. Again, your first attempts might frustrate you, but um, I won't use her exact language, but in Bird by Bird by uh, Anne Lamont, um, she reminds us all that every first draft is not good. She used a different word for it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we should just expect that, and then know that it's going to improve in the next draft. And the same goes for these audio projects. You just you got to do more and more of them to get good at it. And if you stick to it, you will. Um, I love this quote, you know, what you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. And that's every bit as true for the techniques that we're talking about today. Just get started. I mentioned earlier that, you know, for like 300 bucks, you can get everything you need to just get some rudimentary recordings out the door and start getting stuff up on your YouTube and your social channels. To get people used to your content. You know the guy, who's the guy that did uh, the, 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 the Martian? H.T. Wells, more than one. Yeah, that too. Yeah. But recently, The Martian with Matt Damon, I mean, that started out just serialized on the internet. He was releasing chapters one by one, and the thing took off. So you could do your audio projects the same way. So you can get going with what you have for, you know, around three or four hundred dollars. Can you tell us a little about your mic at work? The microphones that you use at work? You need these? Uh, Audio Technica. It's uh, okay, yeah. ATR 2100R. Which one? Uh, ATR 2100R, I think. Okay. Uh, but if you look for Audio Technica USB mic, like on Amazon, mm -hmm. EH Photo, it'll come up. It's, 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 it's very common and it, it works really well. And how about the earphones? The earphones, uh, Audio Technica. Is what? Well. Yeah, I'll get the model number for you. Um, it's, it's in my speaker notes, I didn't realize it. but. Um, so um, you don't have to spend a fortune to get good quality anymore. Um, that barrier has been removed. This it's best to get like what they call studio headphones that have a flat response, so they don't, they don't enhance the bass and they don't enclosed um, ears, so that you get a, a straight, clean sound, so that it doesn't. How many tracks are you using? Say again. How many tracks are you using? Uh, normally, two to three. So I have one for my primary voice track, and then one for music bed and effects, and maybe uh, another one for an alternate voice if I got two people on the recording. 
I mean, almost looks like a 16 track. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the channel on the mixer, that's a, a, a 12 channel USB mixer from Mackie. And so everything that you see here, just going from top to bottom, there's a six channel headphone amplifier. There's my microphone preamp that's more expensive than it needs to be. And then the one below is a power strip. Uh, there's a 12 channel Mackie mixer, two JBL monitors. And then those are uh, Shure SM7 mics with booms. And it was uh, just at or under 2,000 in Sony uh, professional headphones. And it was like around 2,000 or less for all of that. Do you use a spit card? I don't see one. It's, it's uh, on the microphone. They have a big uh, kind of a Zeppelin uh, foam windscreen that comes with the mic. That's one of the reasons I bought it, because I didn't have to get a separate pop filter. I apologize, you may have yeah. covered this. What software do you have to record? Uh, I, I record, I do everything in Premiere. You record it in Premiere as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, you can get like an inexpensive uh, Zoom recorder, a digital Zoom recorder. Uh, Roland has some good ones that are every bit as good, and you can, you don't need a mixer then. You can bypass that. So you can start as small as you want. Is there any trouble rolling it from Premiere to After Effects or to Maya if you want to animate it? No. No, all the files are, are compatible. Zoom. 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 Yeah. Oh, Zoom. Tim, there's one right there in front of you. Oh. That. Over there. My. Oh. That's a Zoom. Right here. The new ones are black, but they're that pocket. They you can get studio quality out of that. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You can get products. Hundred bucks. Hundred fifty. Hundred twenty. Roland has a competing product. I bought a Zoom recorder for my personal use. It's eight channels. It's got a little mixer on it. And it functions as a, it doubles as a controller for so the audience. Zoom and import it into Premiere and you're scrubbing. If you want to give us your email address, we can, I can send you a list of some really good options for that. Okay, well, maybe I'll grab yours or whatever, then I won't wear it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm out of time, and I apologize, I ran over again. Um, but uh, if you want to step up from the $300 version, you know, I just recommend a good dynamic directional microphone. These are ones I've had success with. They're certainly not the only good ones. Uh, I've got the broadcast quality headphones, the shirt, uh, the, the Sony, you can get them, but the audio technical works just fine. Uh, mixer monitors. I can follow up with you afterwards on all these things if you want. That is going to be a great microphone. Yep. I had some recommended resources. We saw this in the last hour. But if you want to take any of these down, they're worthwhile. And I guess I'm out of time.